Well, thank you so much for joining. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this panel is really great. I was saying backstage how well balanced it is, which isn't always the case. Amir is PhD in computer engineering and science. I said is our, uh, our, our nerd on the panel, if that's OK. And uh, Julian, on the other hand, is our investment expert out of Goldman as a CIO of Goldman Sachs Asset Wealth Management. And Noor here, a founder and managing partner of Global Ventures, combines them all. She's got tech background, she's got investing background, and she's got a global perspective. So I love having the three of you on the panel. Look forward to uh, your insights into uh, AI, which is a subject that has come up probably in almost every conversation today, somewhere in there. And it's incredible to think it was November 30th uh, last year that OpenAI released ChatGPT version one. Now they have four versions since. And version one is reputed to have scored in the 10th percentile of the LSAT. Version four has scored 93rd percentile, I think, of the LSAT. So it's learning fast. And on top of that, Mary Meeker, who's known to many of you, is, uh, calls it the fastest moving technology that she has seen in her storied 40-year career. And Peter, Peter Diamandis, I think I've mentioned this one to you, claims there will be two types of companies by the end of the decade, uh, those that embraced AI and those that are out of business. Yeah. So is that hype? Is that, uh, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. But Amir, let me start with you. Why is it this moment? Because AI has been around for a long time. Yeah. Why has it hit our consciousness like this? Yeah, I think um, I was just uh, in the back room was talking about this. I think AI is the word used probably after hi, bye, and thank you, probably most commonly used word these days. And <laughs> this was not the case not too long ago. Like even 15 years ago, AI and machine learning were kind of considered out of fashion terms because this, this area has gone through multiple hype cycles over its, over its terms. It was um, 1950, Alan Turing published a paper to define machine intelligence. And after that, this whole effort started. And it's gone through multiple cycles of creating expectations, high expectations, and um, ending up with uh, disappointment. Um, but this time around, um, I think this, this cycle is, is a real cycle. Because finally, uh, the power of computer has reached a point that pushed AI beyond the threshold. That kind of like is starting to make things that, um, that was previously considered to be human tasks. Um, in, the, in the, the ideas behind AI, a lot of the core concepts are not new. Like when I was first introduced to AI when, as a high school kid, which is a long time ago, uh, the concept of artificial neural network was already considered a very old concept. And that still is really the core uh, technology behind everything that we are seeing. So it wasn't for lack of innovation or imagination or research um, that AI couldn't continue its, you know, the, the, the growth that was uh, expected to have was because AI, at least as we know it today, requires significant amount of compute power. And the compute power was not available at the time. Uh, basically, the idea kind of took, took the results into a better place, but then running into the compute wall. But now, thanks to the Moore's Law that has been in play for over 50 years, the computer's um, storage, communication, and processing of data has become um, so powerful. We have uh, supercomputers in our pocket. And uh, that has really kind of changed the landscape. On the top of that uh, is the vast amount of data that has become available as a result of uh, uh, internet. Invention of internet and proliferation of internet has become, is re really a key technology and reason that why AI this time is so much more powerful. At the end of the day, AI needs a lot of data and needs a lot of compute. And this is the first time that both of these uh, factors are, are in play at the same time. And um, I think there might be a possibility that this, this wave run out of steam because Moore's law is not accelerating as it was before. It's not going on as, as fast of an exponential curve. And um, there are other challenges like thermal and processing and fabrication and so on. So th we might run into a kind of like a situation that the AI, as the fast pace of AI is going to get that bottleneck. But 
still to be seen. There are a lot of uh, technologies that people are working on right now. Yeah, we, we Julian? Heard, we, yeah, yeah uh, we heard um, from a few of the speakers earlier, we were talking about history, I think both Ray and Mary referenced this, and I, look, if you go back to the dot com in 2001, history would suggest you know, this won't be a, you know, a, a, a straight line up and it won't be a, a smooth ride. Um, and th there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that period of time. But I think if you look at it today, there's a confluence of performance improvements that have come through um, in the relatively near term that have just radically upgraded the capability of, of the tools. I think it's accessibility. That unlike some other technologies that are somewhat esoteric and hard for the average person to comprehend, you just can use these tools. It, it, I'm sure you've all done this at this point, but almost every day there's a there's another story about some other tool or dozens of tools you can download and build your own websites and build your own um, workflow tools, and it's just incredibly tangible and real for people, so it's accessible. Um, and then the fi final thing is, like many things right now, I think media and um, social media in particular is playing a large role in just amplifying this. I mean, I wake up every morning to a, a litany of postings on LinkedIn or Instagram telling me about these are the next 10 tools that you have to download, otherwise you're going to get left behind. So I think it's the confluence of those three things, so kind of performance, uplift, availability or accessibility, um, and, and then awareness. Um, and look, I think um, there'll, there'll be some bumps along the road, but it's absolutely changing how um, all businesses operate, or it should be. Uh, it's absolutely changing what we invest in and it's absolutely changing how we invest. I do want to get back to investment in a little bit, but Nora, any comment on that or? Sure, I think that, you know, to Julian's point, it's, um, it's the fact that it's in our face and you run the risk of the same as the dot-com movement, which is that all of these applications are solving for that incremental 2%, or that incremental 5%, if you like. How do you do things a little bit better? How are you more efficient? What's your workflow like? How do we get things in your calendar faster? What we're seeing in the rest of the world is really the application of AI in mass. So how do you increase yield for food security in Africa? And AI has really helped a lot of companies do that. How do you then take the application of AI into a part of the world where there's no credit scoring system to allow for microfinancing, to change the way that populations are able to access finance? So we're investing in companies that do that. So the application of AI is really as an embedded technology in order to enable you to create solutions. Now, are the solutions for that 2%? Or are the solutions for the masses? What we're seeing are the examples I just said, which is across Africa. And then you take a look at the Gulf and the GCC countries. And what's ironic is you know, MIT published an article about three years ago saying that 82% of companies in the Gulf use AI. And that was three years ago. So it's not like we're coming in and saying AI is new and no one's using it. And maybe Peter's right. Either they use it or they die. But this is something that we have been using it. Um, now we've been using it perhaps in sales and marketing and customer service, and now the applications are much more in core competency. So you see that in some parts of the world. The leapfrogging is easier for emerging markets because there is no infrastructure and legacy that you're trying to replace. It's simply how do we use this to solve a real world problem in a market which is nascent. Um, that's how we're seeing the application of AI a little bit more deeply. Well, that's great to hear because too, too often AI is about U.S. and China right now, and, uh, and it's good to hear their applications around the world, but are, it, what kind of financing is happening around that around the world? Is it of the same volume as here, or is it of the same interest and speed as here? I think it's the same interest and speed. <clears throat> I think the volume of financing in the U.S. is always um, it's unsurmountable when you compare it to emerging markets. So even venture capital across the Middle East and North Africa last year as an entire asset class was $3 billion. That's one large round in the Bay Area. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa was another $4 billion. Mm. So you're still talking about very small numbers. However, what a million dollars gets you there is very different to what a million dollars gets you here. And there's a lot more international interest in the part of the world. And the same would apply to other emerging markets where the quantums of capital deployed are much smaller but the impact of the capital is much larger. So I think that the US and you know, China will always win the how many dollars have you deployed into this ecosystem, but they also win the valuations game. When your valuations skyrocket, you need to deploy more and more capital in order to get something done. Hey, and Julian, how do you deploy, or how do you find investment opportunities, either uh, corporate or 
investing, high net worth individual investing mm -hmm. in such a rapidly growing and changing, as you said, if you invested in all the companies in 2000 and the dot com, yeah. you might be out of some money by 2001. Yeah, there were some brilliant ideas, but being wrong is this, uh, being early is the same as being wrong. I, I remember a whole bunch of guys uh, leaving the firm uh, back in 2000, I think it was, to start a, 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 a data storage company, uh, which, um, w which would have been a great idea if they just waited about 15 years. Um, a, a bunch of dark fiber that got laid across the Atlantic that of course laid the groundwork for the subsequent um, TMT uh, boom, but you know, vast amounts of capital were destroyed. Uh, I suspect there'll be some volatility along the Those way. Those were yeah. all Forbes stories, by the it, way. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I remember buying high yield bonds in some of these companies at less than one cent on the dollar. I mean, again, yeah. all that infrastructure money that got um, blown away, actually people were then able to build on top of that and it led to the next wave of, of investment that, that that uh, an investment returns that happened. Um, but look, I, I think it's, it, it will not be a, a straight ride up. There'll be a lot of value created and destroyed. I think it absolutely speaks to the value of active management, um, people that can differentiate rather than just like hoping that the rising tide lifts all boats. I think if you break it down, um, you know, on the, on the, there's the large cap public space and you've already seen some uh, early winners emerge from that space. People who have the financial resources to make the huge capital investments required in both infrastructure, and large language models, and have the data to be able to drive those models. And they're, 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 they're all, they already appear to be winning, and I think that's one way to play it. It's the, it's the infrastructure players. Then there's just the application of the technology, both in public markets and, and also in, in private markets. And I think there's opportunities in both. When we, when we look in private markets specifically, you know, we're, right now we're spending um, less time on those large capital intensive endeavors like, you know, building a new semiconductor plant or, you know, building the latest large language model. It's, it's more finding companies that can leverage off of all of that capability through the application of those tools in things like um, um, healthcare, uh, education, uh, workflow, where it can like leverage off of those capabilities, uh, but in a much more uh, capital efficient and, and asset an asset light way. The other thing that we're doing, it, it's not just about finding the AI company. Um, I mean, I think every company is going to end up having to utilize this top technology. So it's really working across the portfolio to help them understand how it's going to shape their business. It's something we found great value in as a, as a private investor. We have hundreds of portfolio companies, any one of which individually may not have the capability to grasp the complexity of many of the issues that have been thrown at them over the last three years alone, whether it was COVID or you know, US-China geopolitics or hyperinflation or demand destruction, um, supply chain issues, the latest happens to be AI. And when you can actually bring to bear you know, the resources of a large firm to help all of these small and medium-sized companies understand what do we need to do to succeed in the next generation and be one of the winners, um, uh, or, or at least not one of the losers uh, as, we, as we roll the clock forward. And I, you know, I, I, I would, uh, you know, sometimes these statements are always you know, made uh, in, intentionally inflammatory to attract a headline uh, or what have you, but I, I do think there is gonna be a division between companies that, and people that embrace and understand this technology um, and those that choose to ignore it. No, that's great. Yeah, I hope at a base level you had all your clients in NVIDIA for the last year or so. But uh, Amir, let me ask you a question on, um, oftentimes the conversations I get into, the, the very first exposure I had to AI in any depth was maybe 10 years ago, conversation with Kai-Fu Lee, who the Chinese computer scientist and uh, AI, kind of uh, well-known AI circle scientist, he, um, he takes a very dark view of what the future could be, which you hear that dichotomy of this technology is gonna change everything and is great for humanity, and then you hear that dark side of or the singularity where it will eventually exceed human brain power and then becomes quite dangerous. You have any, where do you fall on that continuum? Yeah, that's a very controversial question. I um, mean, if you even even within the AI community, the research community in AI, if you, I mean, I before Cerberus, uh, where I'm working on the investment in AI, I, I worked at Google for about a decade, and so I had firsthand exposure to all these sort of dilemma and conversations and debates uh, through the work that we were doing. And 
I can say that it's a lot of, you know, it's kind of a philosophical discussion about, uh, to have about that. But one thing that I would add is when you look at things like large language models, uh, if you look at the underlying technology behind what, what it's doing, it is, at the end of the day, a very, very sophisticated statistical model that determines like what words come after what sequence of words. There is, there is no true intelligence behind it. it the, the output of it is so elegant that tricks our mind for us to imagine that there is an intelligence behind it. And that goes back to Turing, uh, Alan Turing's paper. That's how the intelligence is defined according to his definition. So from, one, from that angle, because the output sounds so intelligent, it is an intelligent machine. But that intelligence, in my opinion, is very different from the intelligence as we know in biological um, um, species. Where you can't distinguish it from a machine. It's, you cannot you, you, maybe yeah, distinguish from a it. Person. But behind, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, um, again, this is, this is very controversial, but uh, I think the current technology, which is based on zero and ones and transistors, fundamentally is not, this is my personal opinion, it's not, fun, it's not fundamentally the platform that would create a true intelligence as we know in human beings. I think it would probably require a different paradigm. If you go back in time when classical computers were created for the first time, people thought that the classical computers, as they knew it, was going to be very intelligent. That turned out not to be the case, and that was the beginning of AI, and AI took it to the next level. Um, what is going to be the next platform that is going to take this to a true intelligence as we define in human and other uh, biological species? That's the question. Um, there's a lot of debate about it. Uh, but I think, you know, this, this era that we are in, we have created so much of progress over the past decade. Um, Ten years ago, I remember firsthand when we were starting the tensor processing project at Google, that was really, uh, we didn't know what, what, what's going to take us. It was a moonshot. We didn't know whether there was going to be customer for it. Mm, but, but, you know, there is so much more that we see right now. I, th I think perhaps that the issue we might have to confront uh, a little earlier than when do the machines take over the world and we're all um, out of a job is, is, is when does the, you know, this technology has the real, not just the potential, but the likelihood of further exacerbating one of the great problems we're already dealing with today in the world is income inequality. Because the, the, it's going to accrue to the benefit of the, the capital owner, the, the, the large company that can afford to invest in the technology and the machines and the models. So capital is going to, is, it, the, the real risk is that capital is the winner here at the expense of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the human. And that's something we're going to have to deal with in the near term. So I was just looking at the headline, you know, we talk about rewiring the world. Is AI the answer? I think, you know, there's, there's rewiring of how businesses operate and function. And I think this is going to be great for businesses and accelerating both their growth and their uh, operational efficiency. I think it's going to rewire the world in terms of geopolitics because because of the downside or the risk associated with this technology, it's going to be another force to uh, see fragmentation of ownership of assets and where you can invest money, where you're going to be allowed to invest money. And then the third thing has you know the rewiring essentially the the human construct and like the the, the, the mm. relationship between humans and capital and how do we ensure that doesn't get further out of whack than it already is today. Yeah. Yeah, Geneva Convention of AI is kind of, you hear people talk about. Nora, any comments on? I mean, you, I would continue and say you also rewire the ability to provide education to people yeah. in a form that they can actually absorb it. Um, you also rewire the opportunity to provide health care and really start to see where is the need of health care, what are the needs of health care, and how can we do that in a more technical way rather than just boots on the ground. So there, there is all the doom and gloom, but then at the same time, if used well, if used properly, if really conscious capitalism comes into play, you're able to use this to provide basic human needs like education, healthcare, and food security yeah. to millions and billions of people. You know, you, you hear uh, all sorts of stories about everyone's going to lose their job or whatever, and education uh, is never going to be the same. My, my brother is a teacher, and I've heard this from other educators, is using AI and chat GPT, encouraging their students to write papers with it, knowing that they're doing that, and then to use that as a jumping off point for education as to what was right, what was wrong, how it worked, and, and all of that. And I suspect, I have a very optimistic view that we'll figure out new jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and for those of you who have any questions on AI, it was my colleague uh, Steve Bertoni pointed out that the best tutorial is a South Park episode <laughs> yeah. on chat always GPT. <laughs> it's it always true. So with this esteemed panel, we'll end it with a South Park uh, tutorial recommendation. But 
Thank you very much for uh, helping to solve this one.